Hey folks, so today I am going to be talking about something which has been doing the rounds in the Linux community as of late. Uh, it's regarding, of course, Linux Mint, and I'm sure many of you guys will already know uh, what it is that I'm going to be weighing in on, but it's going to be a bit of a ramble, bit of a discussion, um, and uh, I've got a little bit of news towards the uh, towards the end of this video, uh, which I think you guys might enjoy. But uh, as you can see here, I've got a post up which is two weeks old as of uh, the time of recording this right now. And it's basically giving an update on the progress towards uh, Linux Mint 20, uh, which I'm quite looking forward to. Now, for those of you that are wondering, I'm still using Linux Mint on this mainstreaming machine and on my uh, ThinkPad laptop as well that I use to moderate streams and do bits and pieces with. Um, I'm really enjoying it actually. I must admit on this particularly this main machine uh, I've, ac I've, uh, I've switched out and used XFCE because I actually just really cut just like XFCE but otherwise it's the same old uh, Linux Mint that we all know and love. Um, I switched out the desktop environment so I didn't reinstall or anything like that. Um, and it's just something that I've grown used to, and I, I like the idea of, of its modularity. Cinnamon is great and all. Um, the uh, window manager itself actually gave me a few problems when it came to recording with OBS. Uh, those of you that saw my Doom 2 review over on my gaming channel, um, which I'll link to in the description, um, will know kind of what I mean. Otherwise, uh, Cinnamon is an absolutely wonderful uh, desktop environment. But... Um, yeah, so I still use Cinnamon on, on, on all of my other machines, but when it comes to recording, XFC is kind of nice, and it, it does, um, it, it works the way that I, I, I've gotten used to over the years as well, so there is that. And uh, when it comes to Linux Mint 20, I don't know, I might be leaning towards the XFCE version. Uh, I do like Mate as well, and I'm one of those people that can generally use whatever desktop environment's put in front of them. Um, but um, but i got to admit... You know, I think, you know, old habits die hard and uh, XFCE just, just might be the place that I kind of feel like home. But that aside, uh, so this is the monthly news update that we get from the Linux Mint blog. And I do uh, recommend you guys, particularly if you use Linux Mint, just to update on it or if you're interested in distributions as a whole, uh, to, to just keep uh, keep an eye on it. It's always good to know what those guys are up to. I personally find it interesting and it's quite just quite a nice blog as far as I'm concerned. Um but then again, I like following software progress, so that's just me. Uh, so anyway, the part of the blog that I'm going to be talking about today is their approach to snaps. Now, this is the little bit of a hot topic, and I'm going to sort of just muddle my way through it. Um, I don't have overwhelmingly strong opinions on on uh, either side of this issue because I, I see that there are values in snaps, but I also see the reason for, for why Linux Mint have decided to go the direction they have. Um, but anyway, what this, uh, I'll just uh, read out what we've got here. We also heard your, uh, your queries on the topic of SnapD. This is a topic which is important to us, and we already explained our position last year. As you install apt updates, Snap becomes a requirement for you to continue to use Chromium and installs itself behind your back. This breaks one of the major worries many people had when Snap was announced and a promise from its developers that it would never replace Apt. A self-installing Snap store, which overwrites part of our Apt, packages, Apt package base, is a complete no-no. It's something we have to stop and it could mean the end of Chromium updates and access to the Snap store in Linux Mint. So that was their, uh, their position last year. A year later, in the Ubuntu 20.04 package base, the Chromium package is indeed empty and acting without your consent as a backdoor by connecting your computer to the Ubuntu store. Applications in this store cannot be patched or pinned. You cannot audit them, hold them, modify them, or even point, um, or even point snap to a different store. Uh, you've as much empowerment with this as if you were using proprietary software i.e. none. This is in effect similar to a commercial proprietary solution but with two major differences. It runs as root and it installs itself without asking you. First, I'm happy to confirm that Linux Mint 20, like previous Mint releases, will not ship with any Snaps or SnapD installed. Second, to address this situation, we'll do exactly what we said we would. In Linux Mint 20, Chromium won't be an empty package which installs SnapD behind your back. 
It will be an empty package which tells you why it's empty and tells you where to look to get Chromium yourself. In Linux Mint 20, apt will forbid SnapD from getting installed. You'll still be able to install it yourself and we'll document this in the release notes, but by default apt won't allow repository packages from doing this on your behalf. So, assertive words there, but uh, a, a, you know, a strong stance to take, and if I'm completely honest, an understandable one. Uh, the Snap Store backend is proprietary, and it is not like um, apt repositories where you can mirror them on various places around the world and um, you know in inspect them and review them and all this kind of stuff. And whereas I've got a lot of admiration for the Snaps being available cross-platform, and they do work pretty well cross-platform. And when it comes to um, developing Ubuntu and even other distributions by proximity into, uh, you know, significantly, you know, uh, more stable platforms um, using sandboxing and, and containers and all that kind of stuff, then, you know, the results are difficult to argue with. Um, but the question here is, as well, is that in, in many ways, Canonical is, is a company, their job is to, is to make a profitable um, product here. Uh, that's not the same goal as, for example, Debian or Arch or other community-based distributions, including Linux Mint. Um, a lot of this as well also depends on like what software packages will you be deprived from if you are not using the Snap Store. And I can think of very few, if any, where there is a piece of software that is only available on the Snap Store. Um, Almost everything I use is available uh, either as in the repositories, as a flat pack, as an app image, or in some other way, like through the Steam Store or Itch.io or something like that. Um, there are, I'm sure, exceptions uh, here and there, but um, for the most part, I don't know to what degree end users will be affected by this. And I think this is one of those cases where time will tell, and maybe Linux Mint might offer a good contrast to this. One th one reason I think that this is a step in a, a in a solid direction, a good direction, is that it does differentiate Linux Mint from Ubuntu. Um, many people have accused it for, well, since as long as I've known it as a distribution, that it is just Ubuntu that's tweaked for a certain kind of user. Now, sometimes people will say that's a new user or a, a Windows-minded user. Um, but I, uh, I've, I've used Linux Mint for, for quite some time. Linux Mint was the first distribution that made me feel like Linux was my primary operating system, that I, that I was home, that I felt comfortable with it, that I knew that I was going to go the distance with Linux. And a lot of that was the out-of-the-box uh, experience. And that's more important than I think more seasoned Linux users tend to appreciate. Once you know how to set up Linux as you want your distribution as you want it, then it's easy to imagine that uh, that's all you need. But there are plenty of people who are interested in Linux but are less interested in the intricacies of the customization. They like that it's there, they like that they've got the choice, but at the end of the day, something that you can just install and just run with is very appealing. And I think I'm arguably one of those people. Yes, I do like to tweak my operating system, but fundamentally what really attracts me to Linux is the uh, software philosophy of it, the principle of choice rather than the actual use of it, because I might be happy to use whatever desktop environment's thrown in front of me, sure. Um, but if that particular desktop environment suddenly throws a curveball and does something I don't like, then I like the opportunity to change. I'd like to see the exit, even if I don't want to leave. So, it seems to me that Snaps, whilst a very pragmatic solution, are also an attempt for Canonical to get their app store uh, out there on as many distributions as possible, and certainly to integrate it with their, their operating system uh, to, to quite a degree. Um, and I would imagine over time this might be fleshed out into something that they can, um, that they could perhaps, you know, turn a solid profit off of. But it is leaning in the direction of the proprietary, and, and whereas there are plenty of free and open source applications that are available on Snap, the principle of free and open source uh, dictates that it, it would not be beyond the realms of possibility to facilitate another way to acquire that software. Um, and also, uh, when you, uh, you know, install something like Chromium, to use the example, which is a piece of software you would expect to be open source, I believe that Chromium is released under the MIT license. That's not to say that it's completely freedom respecting and all that kind of stuff, but um, 
you know, to to install um, something which which draws in from a proprietary source is not necessarily something users would necessarily consent to if they're aware of, or might reconsider, or at least would like to know. But also, again, I kind of understand that these things need to be seamless to end users as well, especially if you're going to appeal to to to. I'm going to use the term non-technical user, but um, or, or people that just want a a, a you know pragmatic and, and and seamless experience. So, um, it depends what your definition of non-tech user is, basically. Um, so they're going to be focusing on uh, flat packs and what's available in the repository. Um, that to me, I can I can see that kind of uh, makes a lot of sense to me. I don't think on this machine I've got any snaps installed that I'm aware of. Um, so I, I I don't know how much the end uh, experience or end user experience will change, and I think some of that deter uh, is going to be determined by how um, much snaps are integrated into the Ubuntu operating system. So. Um, yeah, I think, to be honest, and this is me throwing my two cents into the arena, I like that Linux Mint is 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 taking a stance that's not in, in a line with Ubuntu to distinguish itself as a separate distribution with separate values in a separate direction. They also have a Linux Mint Debian edition, which is really quite good. And I would say, towards Linux Mint 21, that I would strongly strongly ask them to consider that Debian base as their primary flagship distribution and to make Ubuntu the second one. Obviously, my opinion is fundamentally worthless on the subject, but I would really like to see um, the, the Debian base, you know, and, and to see Linux Mint grow into something that is truly itself and to to, to not be seen as a spin of Ubuntu that's um, a little bit more community centric and um, you know a, li a, li a little bit fundamentally different. A lot of people do ask me, why do you use Linux Mint rather than an LTS of uh, Ubuntu? And on a day-to-day -day pragmatic uh, reason, you know, on for pragmatic reasons, there probably wouldn't be that much difference. Um, but with Linux Mint, I do like that they put that focus on stability. I do like that they put that they are a community-centric distribution rather than one that is fundamentally at the mercy of a for-profit for company. Um, and uh, yes, I do sort of like the their sort of their attitudes and their values and their approaches to things. I guess um, there's going to be no distribution under the sun that you're going to see completely eye to eye with on every topic because you know being parts of a community is fundamentally a compromising proposition, and that's in my opinion, a good thing more than it's a bad thing. But um, the best we can do in these situations is just to pick something that we um, fundamentally like and respect and align with. Now, that's to say, if Linux Mint went away tomorrow, would I go to an Ubuntu-based distribution? Probably. I really like Ubuntu-based distributions. I think they're really good. I think Ubuntu has done wonders for the Linux community at large. I don't think snaps are fundamentally a bad thing, but I do think the criticisms against them are worth noting that this is a direction towards a proprietary. But then again, am I going to throw that same um, criticism at Steam, for example? They have a proprietary um, setup, but they have done wonders for Linux as well. They've brought out Proton. That's an open source compatibility layer that has allowed countless, countless games to be, be, uh, to be played on Linux as good as if they were native, and in some cases, more than you'd think, actually better than on Windows. That's quite remarkable. So, as I always say with these kind of things, the truth is always more complex than we'd like it to be. And I know that on the internet, it's very comfortable uh, to be shouting simple solutions to complex problems. And that's really not the world we live in. And I'm hoping and expecting that most of you guys will see eye to eye with me on that, that these are not simple. Uh, uh, you know, this is none of this is, is simple, straightforward, and that there is one size fits all. We are all of different mindsets and different values and, and different approaches, different skill levels and all of that. That's a good thing, but it is also a complex thing to work with. Um, all in all, do I think they've made the right decision? Yes. Even though it would not necessarily determine whether I use or do not use Linux Mint personally, the fact that they have decided not to include the Ubuntu store, which is basically kind of what it is, out of the box, 
um, sort of um, provides them with a, uh, a a sort of a an independence, I guess, from that particular proprietary infrastructure. And I think that's worthwhile. I think that's worthwhile. Um, but I, 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 and I, I think I've been saying this for quite some time now that, um, it, you know, it might it might be a good time to base their, um, you know, to, to, to make their Debian edition, their flagship one. It's a really good distribution. And uh, Canonical and Ubuntu, when they've developed, they uh, upstream most of their stuff. Like, they are really good open source citizens in that regard. Um, and and so the benefits of Debian are still the benefits of Canonical and Ubuntu, but they've just been um, contributed to, to to the Debian project, which is, um, I think, you, you know, when it comes to software ethics, really as good as you can get um, when tied in with, of course, the pragmatism of... of, of um, of of actually running Linux on on all this different hardware that we've got under the sun. So, um, anyway, that's just my two cents. Uh, please do let me know what you think in the comment section below. Um, but again, just to sum it up, I don't have a huge problem with the Snap Store. I don't have a huge problem with proprietary store platforms coming to Linux. Um, but I also kind of respect distributions for not wanting to include them out of the gate. So, there we go. I'm sorry that opinion's a little bit lukewarm. You know, I know, I know in this day and age, it's pick a side, pick a side. Um, and sometimes you do got to pick a side. Uh, but I think in this situation, um, I think we can coexist. I think that's a good thing about uh, free and open source software. Anyway, I did mention that I was going to share some news with you guys today. It's not so much news, it's just something that I want to keep you aware of. Uh, first off, I do have quite a handful of um, different YouTube channels, which a lot of people don't know that I've got. I, I also stream a lot on Twitch, so I'm going to make sure I'm going to include my social media links in the description of this video today. That's going to be Twitch, uh, my gaming channel, and um, also what I'm going to include is uh, my Peertube account. I put a lot of content up on Peertube, and when I was planning out this video, I did consider making it a Peertube exclusive. Uh, I'm really enjoying my time over at Peertube. Um, you can subscribe to my Peertube channel either on RSS or if you're on something like Mastodon or in you know in the Fediverse at large, you can also subscribe to it using using you know your your Mastodon account. Um, so I'll, I'll include all of that. Uh, if you're ever short or ever wish to know what I'm up to in terms of non youtube things, my website is always the place to go, chrisware.uk. That'll be a link, of course, that I include as well. Um, and uh, don't worry, that is a that is a perfectly ethical website. There are no tracking cookies whatsoever, no JavaScript. It is, um, and you can inspect the code yourself. I think you just press Control and U, and you've got all the HTML there right in front of you. Uh, I've coded it myself on neocities.org. There's a video about that website uh, and that service down um, in in this channel, uh, further back in this channel. Uh, and uh, yeah, I coded the whole thing myself. It's quite basic looking because I don't know, that's the aesthetic I was going for. Designed to be particularly accessible to all um, all, all, all people under the sun, pretty much. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of stuff, including RSS feeds for all the stuff that I'm doing. I'm a big fan of RSS, as you guys uh, presumably know, or those of you that have watched my videos. But um, like I said, I'm probably going to be doing quite a few more Peertube exclusive videos. Um, in the future and, and part of that is because just because I kind of like making videos for like a small close-knit community I kind of feel like that's that's a little bit like what YouTube was for me like five years ago um, and now when I make a video on this channel I always kind of feel a little bit like I'm in the spotlight more than I'm you know and, and more than I'd like to think that I am sometimes so, so I know that not many of you guys are really going to go over to Peertube and subscribe to me I know it's going to be a small perhaps more FOSS enthusiastic segment of, of my audience but uh, just to have like a, li a little small space that doesn't have all of this uh, is, is kind of fun it's kind of comfortable it's like it's like old school YouTube I kind of like that um, so uh, so anyway uh, there we go. That's that's about it for me today. Thank you guys very much for watching. So yeah, Twitch, other YouTube channels, Peertube, website. All links in the description below. Thank you guys very much for watching. That's about it for me today. I've been Chris Ware, and you've been absolutely awesome. Toodaloo.